Phil, uh, please tell me about your business and why it's important to you. Um, the business, Brother UK, is, is the sales and marketing and operational uh, arm of the Brother Industries, which is based in Japan. That's a multinational business and I'm responsible for uh, all of the UK operations. Um, our business today is mostly orientated around computer printers, uh, scanning and digital devices as well as web conferencing systems and we'll have celebrated 50 years in the UK in 2018. The business is terribly important to me because I believe that the work that we do actually powers business in the UK so I'm very passionate about that. Um, our purpose at Brother is to grow ourselves through growing others and what that means is we're highly orientated towards making sure the things that we do and the devices that we make come in and allow you to grow and help you to grow. So that really fulfills our overall purpose as an organisation. Who, Phil, do you turn to for advice, guidance and support? And can you give me please, uh, um, the, I'd say, the best advice to date? Well, I have a whole network of people that, that surround me, whether they might be friends, acquaintances, or indeed professional people. So in the past, we've used psychologists, uh, professional coaches. But I think as you become more established as a leader in a business, you, you really do turn to people that you trust. And they oft might often be either people also in business who might be able to advise you on specific things uh, related to your day-to-day -day work. Um, but equally, I think it's really key to have people outside your business, uh, really good friends of yours who you can release and sound off to. In terms of great advice I've received, perhaps one thing that always falls to my mind is never make permanent decisions on temporary emotions. And uh, that's really what a good one to allow yourself to have a check and balance system to orientate about how you're feeling in any given moment before you make a decision and making sure that good decisions are made based upon sound judgment um, in a moment without bias. How have you taken your business to uh, the next level? Well, of course, we're all aspiring to get to the next level as much as we possibly can. And uh, I guess over the years, the thing that I've realised most is that you do have to set some audacious goals for the people that you work with. Of course, everyone needs to be stretched and they can't be so far away that they are unachievable. But having a challenging mindset and having an ability to stretch people, I think, contributes massively to a business then overachieving. So constantly setting those stretching goals has been a winning pattern for me. So a good example might be earlier in my career when we wanted to attack the plain paper fax market. And at the time, uh, Brother weren't really in the market in a very big way. And we wanted to do something to basically take the number one position in the market very, very quickly. So it really was what we described at the time, a BHAG, a mm. big, hairy, audacious goal. And everybody thought we weren't, wouldn't achieve it. And we knew what we had to do to achieve it. And by stretching ourselves with that target, we went on to achieve it. And that was a combination of having the right product at the right price. So we had some technical elements to the delivery of, of that goal. But then we also had a really driven bunch of people who, having had that and seen that target, really became quite motivated by it. And once you put in the financial incentive for them to, to get there, um, we all ran for it and achieved it. What do you do, Phil, to create an environment where your team of people uh, feel they can take risks to uh, hopefully grow the business faster? I think any leader um, in the business wants, wants people to take those risks, but of course they want them to also manage those risks and perhaps not be uh, too extreme with those risks. Um, so one thing that I've learned uh, in my career is, is that actually if you've encouraged somebody to take a risk and it goes wrong, is to make sure that, that what you're not delivering there is, is a load of criticism around the risk or what happened, but to actually reward the fact that they took the risk, but then look for the shared learning as you pull it back to say, what would we do better next time? Mm. So I think it's for the leader de to actually determine the amount of risk that the business actually takes, but to also make sure that individuals feel empowered to take that risk in parallel. Phil, uh, we all love a growing business, but what action do you take when the business is not actually hitting its targets? Well, we're a sales-driven business, and I think any sales leader will be, always be faced with that situation where you might have a growing sector or a very ambitious goal that you're trying to achieve. And uh, we've been there many, many times. So this is very familiar ground uh, to me. And the one thing I've learned is really about making sure that you're doing the good things well. Um, so if you do the really good things really, really well, then what you tend to find is that creates a very good bedrock for your general performance. 
The thing that gets in the way that I've seen most of the time is when actually individuals have too many priorities. That's one of the really big root causes that uh, your business ends up going in all sorts of directions rather than following a main effort. So my advice is always, if, if we're ever uh, behind the curve, is we, we really look to see are we doing the things that we should be doing really, really well and really start from there. A short anecdote that I could perhaps give which supports that is I was recently uh, at a dinner with uh, Abby Chamberlain who was one of the former women's international rugby captains and she talked about something that the team used called a safety blanket and that was if they were under pressure, if they were losing a game or if things weren't going their way, they called for the safety blanket and what that actually meant was every single member of the team went back to doing the patterns of play which they excelled within and what that did is establish the firm base for them to build further performance. How do you keep yourself fresh as a leader, Phil? That's a really good question and the technique I use is something I've designed called out on in, which is I try and divide my time up to be roughly a third out of the business, a third on the business and a third in the business. And when I go out of the business, that's really about uh, looking forward and understanding technology trends, societal trends, just general direction, things that are going on. So really having a look at your landscape and your direction of travel. When you bring that back to your business, you then can take those things and decide what the on element of that should be. So what should you onboard from those learnings you've seen externally, which is going to change your strategy or direction of the business. So that then, then changes your course. Mm -hmm. And the last bit, which is the in, is when you've got to go and change the people because you might have to undertake some sort of strategic change of direction as a result of the things that you've seen. So I found that out on in, just as a general framework, serves me very well and keeps me fresh. What's most important to the business, Phil? Is it a mission, core values, or is it something else? Well, within our own business, it's really about having the values well lived. And we've got three key things that we focus on in the business and they are uh, pride which means personal responsibility in delivering excellence and that means every single person's job is to not only do their job but improve their job. Mm. The second part of that we call team. Together everyone achieves more. So by having excellent individuals then working in a positive team environment we get a great amplifier effect. And the third element of that is something we call at your side, which links to our entire global philosophy. And that's how we are at the side of each other, being a learning and developing organisation and, and uh, helping each other as colleagues, but also about how we now uh, see our products and see our customers and help them grow. How do you know, Phil, when your values are, are being really effective and working for the business? Well, with, with values, of course, a lot of the work that goes on and hopefully is things that you don't see. Uh, they're the things that should happen every day in the way that colleagues might support each other or perhaps take approaches to problems that they've got to solve in the business. So there's a lot of that going on. You've got informal back channels that might feed information back to you. But a more formal way of perhaps doing that is we are an Investors in People Platinum Workplace, one of the first in the country actually, very difficult level of uh, IIP to achieve. And to achieve that level of uh, accreditation, you have to have a pretty in-depth um, review of your entire business, and that includes everything about how you link strategy to culture, to visions, to values, everything. And uh, to come through that process and be um, recognised as one of the leading companies in the UK, for me, uh, provides great evidence of our approach. How do you support and encourage the development of your team? Well, learning and development is an absolute bedrock of what we do and, and also, I guess, strongly linked to our Investors in People uh, Platinum Accreditation. Uh, every uh, colleague in the company has an annual learning and development goal that they need to achieve and that's based upon ours, actually, and that includes me uh, and every single individual who, who works within our work community. And the way we link that is, is that we would have some core bits of training that we would want everybody in the company to do. One core example would be Last year we trained every single uh, individual around resiliency. Mm -hmm. So if we understand our external market environment, of course having more resilient people is a great way to try and then have an entire workforce more agile to respond to your outside world. So then we have individual pieces of learning and development which might be linked to an individual's task or their job or the specialisation. And then of course more generic bits of training which might be about moving people from management to leadership. 
So the entire approach we have around learning and development is linked to our strategic objectives. That's the really key thing. You shouldn't just be training for training's sake. You should be training your workforce in order to meet your future need. Please share, what questions should every successful leader ask of themselves? Well, in my experience, I've, I've been lucky enough to meet some really fantastic leaders and uh, a couple of attributes that I've noticed about those people are, the first thing is, is that they um, are very aware of their personal bias, um, whether that be um, confirmation bias or a specific, you know, logic-based thinking. They're really aware of that and what they look to do is they look to flex that as often as they possibly can and to understand that, that decision-making from a point of your personal bias is, is probably, probably quite a dangerous thing. So you have to not only flex, but surround yourself with people who can uh, challenge your, your personal bias and your thinking. And the second thing that I've noticed about those individuals is they're very aware of the shadow they leave when they come into a room. And you've always got to be looking um, about the shadow that you cast, about who becomes quiet, who is trying to kind of be seen by you. Because of course, all of those things can sometimes mean that, that you're not getting the information as a leader that perhaps that you need. So I think once you understand your personal bias when you enter a room and then the shadow that you leave when you, when you cast when you're in the presence of those individuals, it's a very, very good way of making sure that you don't leave any stone unturned when it comes to quality thinking. How do you ensure, Phil, that you continue to grow and learn as a leader? It's a dangerous point when you think you have learned everything you need to learn. So um, I think you, the old adage of you don't know what you don't know. So uh, for me, I read a lot. I try and make sure that I'm going through at least one book every single month uh, in order that I can get on board some new learning or some new thoughts. Um, I've mentioned previously about spending a lot more time out and I believe by being out more, uh, you tend to just naturally change your opinion because you bump into a lot more interesting people. I ride my bike a lot, um, so I put in somewhere in the region of uh, 500 hours a, a year on my bike and, and being on the road allows me to think and expansively think quite a lot and I think that in itself allows you to um, look at certain situations and evaluate them far more differently than if you were just literally in the grind all the time going from task to task to task. So I think that provides a lot of opportunity uh, for personal growth. And finally, um, I would always suggest to people that, you know, put yourself in strange situations, create some BHAGs, some big, hairy, audacious goals, things that are going to really stretch you and, and find new ways to physically stretch yourself or mentally stretch yourself or physically stretch yourself. Um, a great example I had of that only recently was um, being in a, in a Buddhist meditation class and, and hearing the most amazing lesson from one of the Buddhist nuns, which struck me with one of the greatest sort of business lessons I'd ever heard, but it was linked to a Buddhist teaching. So I think learning is all around us, if only you look for it. So we've talked about different environments can really help create our thinking, Phil. Um, can you give an example of that? Yes, a great example um, that I, I can give around that was this time I spent with the Buddhist nun and it was at the end of a meditation class where we just sat down with a cup of tea and everybody had left and there was me one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And uh, we just got talking about certain things around, around work culture and then some of the insights that she began to give me from sort of the teachings of Buddha, which I kind of wasn't massively familiar with, uh, I was kind of going tick, tick, tick. And so an example of that might be was about coming from every position from a position of kindness, which is, is kind of giving everybody the benefit of the doubt and I'm trying to walk in the shoes of other people uh, before you uh, apply some sort of judgment to them. And I think what that did for me was remind me that um, everybody is different in a workplace. Everyone has a different agenda and a different environment a different personality, different things going on in their home and in their lives. And of course, if you instantly apply judgment, then that indeed is already applying a filter of a distorted view, which may lead you to make judgments about an individual incorrectly. So I, I kind of, when I hear these things, um, sometimes your greatest learnings are not coming from directly from a leadership book or a conference, but actually from unfamiliar environments. Please share, Phil, your one piece of advice for successful leaders. That's an interesting question and uh, perhaps the answer might surprise you. My answer would be spend some more time writing. And uh, I don't consider myself to be a gifted writer by uh, any means. But what I've realised is, is that the more that I share my thoughts with people, either people that I work with or people externally, 
by writing blogs or social media posts. What I began to realise was, was that you become very influential and pe more people want to work for you, more people want to spend time with you, opportunity tends to arrive much more quickly at you and you, get, you begin to create a new audience beyond the, the daily things that you do in your organisation for your products or services. So whilst it's not really obvious, um, I'm a great believer that, that you should create great content. Much of the great content that exists in your company is probably in your head. And my suggestion to you is, is how do we get out of there and how do we get that shared more? It's down to you. How would you describe your style of leadership, Phil? I've been described as energetic, strategic, uh, caring and achievement orientated. They're some of the words that, that you read when you look at things like investors and people uh, returns. Uh, but I've been working on a framework for a number of years now uh, for something I call the correlative leader. And I called it the correlative leader because of the correlation between all the individual pillars that I'm about to describe to you. And why I believe in 2017, these are the key attributes that a leader needs to possess running a relevant modern company. And the four attributes are physical leadership, and that means it can be anything from the way that you look after yourself uh, the study of neuroscience or indeed the physical space that you design for your people to work within. Emotional leadership, which I hope is pretty self-explanatory because that's been going on for about 30 odd years now. Mm. Um, then there is digital leadership, which is actually how you as a modern leader um, connect with people, your customers and also your talent and your own workforce using digital platforms, which uh, I think is a less developed skill perhaps in a lot of older leaders. And finally, it's spiritual leadership, which is the one that, that often people go, ooh, uh, mm -hmm. that really is uncomfortable because a lot of leaders haven't got to the, even the emotional bit yet. But what I've realized is, is that, that, that now we're in a sort of a time and a place where people want to have far more meaningful discussions about why they might be here. If someone's hitting their 50th birthday, for example, it can often bring a lot of very searching questions. And you as a leader, if they're one of your high-performing individuals or top talent, you need to have a conversation with them which is deeper than the KPIs of the company mm -hmm. and more connected to who they are and what they, want, what they want to become. So I believe the correlative leader framework uh, is something which more and more businesses will begin to adopt and more and more individual leaders will see the value within. What questions, Phil, do you regularly ask your team? I'm used to turning up at people's desks because I like to walk the floor a lot within my own company and the questions that normally come to mind are firstly um, how are you and, and I don't just mean how are you and expect a response that says I'm fine how are you but what I want to understand is, is how are you what's going on with you and, and let's have a conversation firstly. The second thing would be is what's the number one pain point on your desk right now? So one thing that you think that I need to know which is making your job quite difficult to do, um, that's really important. So somebody can have a platform to talk to you. The third thing will be, will be what should we start to do, stop doing and continue doing? And, and it's amazing what responses you can get when you ask questions like that because people generally have got immediate answers in their head which could instantly improve the way that you run your business. Phil, will you please share your top three personal insights to leading success? My top three personal insights would be, firstly, um, to live life on purpose, in inverted commas, brackets, not by accident. So figure out your purpose, who you are, and also figure out your company's purpose, why people would want to work with you, and what a difference you're going to make to the world. That I think is really, really key. The second insight that I'd like to share is about the health of the leader dictates the health of the business. And that's something I learned from working with business psychologists many, many years ago, that actually you've got to be in great shape and then your business is in great shape. And I mean mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. All of those things have got to be congruent. Uh, otherwise, it's surprising how your culture changes based upon your own footprint within it. The final insight or tip that I'd like to leave today would be, if everything's a priority, nothing is a priority. Mm -hmm. And I meet lots of business leaders that, that make so many priorities in their business that nobody knows what to do first. And I would always say that you should figure out your main effort, give clarity to your people, and then give them the resources and let them get on with it.